Kia ora te whanau, uh, ihu karaiti ko Andrew Doubleday Aho. And today we're looking at the Gospel for Sunday the 28th of January and it's Mark chapter 1 verses 21 through to 28. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and kept on saying, or kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. At this point in the narrative, in my print version of the Bible, we're still on page one of Mark's Gospel. This is Jesus' first act recorded in Mark's Gospel, his first act of public ministry. And he starts with a bang. I've personally had no experience of the demonic, of these unclean spirits as they're called. I will not discount their possibility and simply put it down to mental illness, although I'm not discounting that possibility either. I participated recently in a bit of an online debate where there was a, uh, a practicing psychologist weighing in and talking about multiple personality disorder and claiming that because the symptoms can be repressed with drugs, it can't be such a thing as an unclean spirit. Now for me, the logic didn't, um, didn't follow. Um, the difficulty though with drugs, and they do give people a life, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be a cure. It merely is a form of repressing whatever it is that's coming out. A form of chemical restraint. And that if we stop the drugs, there's a likelihood that this unclean spirit, or whatever it is, will assert itself. And part of the problem, part of the tragedy, is that drugs tend to come at a cost to the personality. It means that the person functions much better than they would have done otherwise, but never perhaps enter into the fullness of their humanity, which could be theirs. So I won't discount the possibility that there is, that there is something there, and that true healing might ultimately be possible. But let's just take the story here at face value. It seems that this unclean spirit was afraid. Was afraid of Jesus, of God. In fact, to say he was afraid perhaps is an understatement. That this spirit was terrified. And this is consistent with other encounters that we see in Scripture. They knew who Jesus was. And they had a deep-seated belief that Jesus was out to destroy them, to absolutely, totally, and completely annihilate them. Because that's the strength of the words that are used here. But this raises a question for me. It raises a question about these spirits. Is there any possibility for them of redemption? of new beginnings, of fresh starts, even for such unclean spirits. 
is there a place for them where they could realize that they have hitched their wagon to the wrong horse? They've been sold a pup. Perhaps places where Jesus deals with them with a measure of compassion. And I think there's a hint of that in the story of the one that's called Legion, where they beg of him to, to um, cast them into the swine, which he does. The problem for us, and perhaps the problem for them, and let's call them them, is that so much of our perspective is shaped by others, including our perspectives of others. How often have you had a negative view of someone simply on the basis of what you've been told about them by somebody else? This is equally true of Jesus and of God. It's equally true of those potentially unclean spirits, that they've been sold a package and they might have made other choices if they had known differently. I can't say for sure, but I'm left wondering. So we're often shaped by what we're told by others and often i mean i've i've reflected on it as i've thought about these things back in my own life with no real necessary personal experience ourselves now one of the first and pervading lies about god that we discover right at the beginning of scripture is this lie that god is not good that god is not for us that God is holding out on us in some way, not committed to our best. We find this in Genesis chapter 3, where the goodness of God is called into question. And at the core of this talking serpent's challenge to the woman, the starting place for evil, and it's that God is not good, is not love, is not committed to her well-being and must be feared above all things because this God has nefarious motives. That that God wants to judge us, is looking for excuses to find us guilty, for reasons to condemn, for cause to punish us and to keep us down, to keep us in our place, to keep us small and less. Now, you may say, nonsense, Andrew, I don't believe any of that. Yet, you are likely clear about who deserves grace and who doesn't. You likely have a clear sense of who you'll meet in heaven and more importantly, who won't be there. And likely you'll have a clear sense of those that God loves and those that God hates. And God loves those who believes the things that we do, who agrees with us. Those who live according to the moral code that we do, at least publicly. But it raises the question for me that there could be something demonic about the way that we actually frame God. That there will be those who may accuse, now accuse me, of siding with the enemy of God, of calling white black and black white. That's possible. Those who are committed to defending God and God's honour, who are committed to God's righteousness, His justice and wrath, and who continue to read Scripture, continue to read God, and continue to read the world, I want to suggest, through the eyes of fear. I know I have for long enough. Just like this unclean spirit, that God is more just than loving, more righteous than merciful, 
more judgmental than compassionate. That ultimately God is more judge than love, more to be feared than to be loved. So here we see this tormented person set free by Jesus, free from the terror, free from the fear, all of this part of the life of the unclean spirit. And maybe there we have the nub, the center of the issue. As I've said, fear has been a large part of my life. Um, only over recent years being broken free from it. And it's ultimately been fear of God. Where fear has been stronger than love. Where fear of judgment has had a greater place in my life than confidence in forgiveness. Where fear of getting it wrong has been more powerful than trusting to God's goodness. Now here's the thing. There's a verse that I keep praying every day. God has not given us a spirit of fear, of timidity, of cowardice, but a spirit of power, of can do, a spirit of love, that which seeks the highest and the best, a spirit of self-control, of self-discipline, of soundness of heart and of mind. These are the words of Paul as we find them in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. And they're for all of us. They express a truth which we all need to imbibe, which we all need to swing, swim in, which we all need to have as part of who we are. We can parrot these words yet still be primarily motivated by fear. So I'm wondering, as I look back, what different traje trajectory my life might have taken if the power of love in it had consistently overwhelmed the power of fear. Now, I've used this poem before and I'm going to use it again by Michael Lernig because I think he really identifies something at the core of what we're talking about. The poem's title, Love and Fear. There are only two feelings, love and fear. There are only two languages, love and fear. There are only two activities, love and and fear. There are only two motives, two procedures, two frameworks, two results, love and fear, love and fear. It's worth reflecting on as we approach in our own lives those moments of decision. When we have a choice to be made, a discerning of which path to take. It's worth doing an honest inventory and asking, what is it that's motivating me? Is it love or is it fear? Fear heads us down the path ultimately of torment, the torment of the unclean spirit. Love leads us ultimately into life and its fullness. And as Jesus starts his public ministry, he chooses the life-giving power of love over the diminishing, cheating, life-depriving power of fear. May we do the same. God bless you. Amen.